Hello, everyone. It's time for Bible class. Why do you say we have one? That should be fun, won't it? We're only 24 hours late. Not to worry. I didn't even have to have a nap this afternoon, so, you know, things are good. Um, I do apologize for last night, but I don't think it matters a great deal. That we, as long as we get the Bible study in and get it on the recording, and whoever wants to see it, they can see it in, on Facebook, and they can see it on YouTube, and... and um, so we'll just proceed as if we had not made any errors. Isn't that a good way to do it? I think it is. All right. Uh, I want you to um, turn with me, first of all, to Acts chapter 9. I want to establish, as I know this is a common everyday occurrence that you know what this verse says, but nevertheless, I want us to be sure to have a grounded foundational stone to go into what we're going to talk about here tonight. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 9, the Lord strikes down Saul to the ground, and uh, he's, he falls to the ground and is blinded by the light. And uh, three days and three nights later, the Lord sends Ananias to him uh, with words concerning uh, uh, the, the call of the Lord on his life, and Ananias doesn't want to go. So pick up where the Lord begins to speak to Ananias about, yes, you must go. We'll look in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, that would be the Lord speaking of Saul of Tarsus, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Notice the um, emphasis that the Lord places to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now keep reading. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, I want you to notice that because we're, going, we're not going to talk about Paul's suffering. We might touch on one or two things. We're not going to talk about the Lord's calling of him in particular, but I want you to see those things as they're put together in verse 15 and 16. Ananias was to say to him, get on with it, brother. The Lord's called you. And I, I realized I took a little license there. But Ananias is to just go do his job, lay hands on him, he gets his sight back and so forth. Now, what when the Lord said, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake, that sets up the picture of what comes next in your Bible from Acts chapter 9 on. Now, it takes a while to unfold because the Lord is dealing with Saul on a different basis, looks like for about three years. You can say that simply because he didn't go back to Jerusalem for three years, but I'm not sure you should say it like nailing a nail a, a board with a nail. It's not that sure, but it might be. Most people agree with that. Some people want to argue about that, but then the people who want to argue about that would probably argue about anything. You know what I mean? So it's not so much that. But what I want you to see is the attitude and the emphasis that the Lord places on this. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my sake, for my name's sake. Now, here's the thing. I want you now to look in Acts chapter. Um, see, I had this all shortened down a while ago how I was going to do this. So uh, look in Acts chapter uh, 15. Acts chapter 15. Paul by circumstances, and they, they're uh, attributed to in, in, in the, the first two chapters of the book of Galatians. He has to go to Jerusalem because he has to settle a thing that, that has interfered with his ministry, and he can't have that. He has to stop it, and so he goes to uh, uh, Jerusalem. Notice in uh, verse 1, and certain men which came down from Judea, they came down, by the way, to Antioch in Syria came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, uh, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So it goes up there, and people want to argue with Paul, and he won't put up with it. And so Peter intercedes and stops them from arguing with him. And then... The Lord has Paul and Barnabas explain, Barnabas and Paul, explain to these people in Jerusalem just what the Lord has been doing and showing to them. 
Now, if you'll hold on to chapter 15 and go to Galatians chapter 2, or yes, Galatians chapter 2, let me show you something of the detail, just a little bit. Not, not, we're, not, we're not talking about this. This is just a setup. The detail, Galatians chapter 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, which means the Lord told him to go and communicated unto them that gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles. That gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles. Well, then if he had to tell them the gospel he was preaching, it must not have been the gospel they were preaching. Simple as that. And he does that. So now go back to, hold on to Galatians 2. We're not quite done there, but look in Acts chapter 15 again. And so he finishes. And, um, and it, they, they told of miracles and wonders and so forth amongst the Gentiles. Verse 13 now. And after they had held their peace, James, not James, the brother of John, he was killed with a sword in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. James, probably the half-brother of Jesus, may not be able to prove that, but it looks that way by some other things that Paul says, like in Galatians 1, when he said, that's one he knew. When he went to Jerusalem, he met James, the Lord's brother. Now, here's my point about this verse. James seems to take over some form of authority here in Jerusalem, where Peter is at and the rest of the apostles are at, but James seems to have the authority. And he says certain things that tell you that. In verse 13, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. <clears throat> After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I'll build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God, James is still speaking, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is, and he sets out that letter that's famous for being taken out. Now, my point is this. James is not being allowed to interfere with Paul's ministry, but James is hearkening back to Amos, Chapter 9, verse 10, 11, 12. And there's, he knows there's all kinds of, of scripture that backs up what Amos chapter 9 is talking about. As a matter of fact, you go into Isaiah and you start in chapter 56 and you go straight through 66 and Gentiles and the things that they do for Israel sometime, somewhere is numerous. It's hard to keep up with all of it. They do so many things for the Jews or Israel. Now, you can find that in Zechariah, that the Gentiles are there when the Lord reigns. You can find it in Haggai, when he talks about what goes on in the temple in the future, in Zephaniah, in Micah, in Joel, and all those chapters in Isaiah. That's a lot of expectation. So here's Paul preaching a gospel these men didn't know in Jerusalem. They didn't know it. He preaches that gospel. Now look back in Galatians and look in chapter 1, verse 11. For I neither received the gospel, I'm sorry, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The 12 apostles did not teach Paul what to preach. He got it directly from the Lord Jesus Christ by revelation, just like it was the revelation of the Lord that sent him up to Jerusalem. So Paul doesn't argue with these people. He does not even try to placate them. James writes a letter and says, do this and everything will be okay. And so they go forth. Now, when they go forth, in Acts chapter 16, Barnabas goes with um, um, John Mark, and they go back to Barnabas's home, where Barnabas was from. Uh, Silas stays with Paul, and they pick up, uh, Mark, they have Mark there, according to Acts chapter 2, I mean Galatians chapter 2, and, and then they pick up Timothy, and it looks like about chapter uh, 16, verse uh, uh, 10 or 11, 10, I guess it is, uh, that it looks like they picked up the author of Acts, which most people believe is Luke. 
So now it's Paul and, and Silas and Timothy and Mark and Luke. Quite a five some, probably been a good basketball team someday. Now here's the thing. They went on a mission and they went places and they did things. And they the next place they went was into Philippi, which, in which there was no synagogue. And so they preached to anybody, but they started off with the women who resorted on the Sabbath day, which implies they were is they were Jews, Israelites. And Paul went to them, prayed with them, spoke with them, and they believed Paul. Some of them believed, and, and uh, he named some, and then he gets thrown in jail. Then the Philippian jailer, turns out, knows something about household salvation, so it probably implies that he was a Jew. So he's going to go to the Gentiles, but there he is in Philippi where there is no synagogue, and he, he goes to Jews instead. He didn't go to, he didn't go to, to, um, um, he doesn't go to the, the Gentiles directly. He goes to, now look back in Acts chapter uh, 17, after he gets out of Philippi in Acts chapter 17, they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, and they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Notice in uh, in chapter 17, verse uh, uh, 10, uh, there's, a, there's a hubbub going on there in Thessalonica, and it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went unto the synagogue of the Jews. Once again, there, he, there they go to the Jews. Um, so went to Philippi, they went to the Jews, the Thessalonica, they went to the Jews, and, and now here again in, in Berea, they go to the Jews. Uh, and verse 11 says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Why did they believe? Because when they heard the word, then they searched the scriptures. Heard the word? Search the scriptures. Heard the word? Search the scriptures. If anything that should tell you um, that should tell you listen to the preacher, don't take his word for it. Search out the scripture. Let the scripture, scripture tell you what the Lord wants you to know. And that's why one of the better things you can do in, in a Bible class is every time the, the preacher or teacher mentions uh, a scripture, write it down. If he goes to read it, write it down. Why? So you can go remember the order in which he did it. Read them as, as best you can in the order that the, that the teacher gave it to you. What for? That would make you understand how come he did it that way and how it was done. Now, here's the thing. When this all takes place, uh, notice the next place they go um, after Athens, look in Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, they go to Corinth. Now, probably, I don't know for sure, but probably this would be closer to uh, A.D. 53 or 54. This is some 20 years after Christ was crucified, probably about 18 or 19 or closer to 20 years since Paul was converted. Because I, I believe he's converted within a few months after uh, the resurrection of Christ. Now, anyway, or the ascension of Christ. Now, anyway, whatever you believe that, I don't care. We don't need to argue about that. Acts chapter 18, though, he goes to Corinth. Now, what he just did there is he got out of Jewish country. In other words, if you put up here, like, like here's where, um, the, this is, let's say this is Jerusalem. And Paul goes over this direction, but he goes to um, Philippi, which is in Europe. Then he goes to Thessalonica. Then he goes to um, uh, Berea, and now he has come down on this, all, all the way down to the bottom, of, if you will, of this long peninsula, and he goes to Corinth. And in Corinth, same, things changed somewhat. Now, I'm going to talk about the word changing. I believe the word got a lot clearer, but I want you to notice in Acts chapter 18, they're in Corinth, verse 5. He's going to the synagogue every Sabbath. Verse 5, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be 
upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go to unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshiped God, whose house joined heart of the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now, the fascinating thing is, he said, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And in the context of going to the Gentiles and the blood, their blood bleed on their own heads, uh, the, the church, the, the place he goes to teach is right next to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believes. Jews believing Paul's message. I believe there were hundreds, maybe thousands of them in all the time that he did this sort of thing. Now, my point is this. Watch what the Lord says. Verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months. So altogether, 19 or 20 months, he's there in Corinth. Preaching. Some Jews believe, sure did. Some Jews got saved, had to. Paul preaching the gospel of salvation. But Gentiles also. Now notice in 1 Corinthians, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Well, I can't get out of Romans. There you go. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He's writing to the Corinthian church, remember? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all meat eat the same spiritual meat. Wow. Were they Jews or were they Gentiles? Look in chapter 12, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Were they Gentiles? Yes, they were. Were, were there Jews there? Yes, there was. So the Gentiles sort of like overwhelmed the Jews, not so much in persons. I don't know the numbers. But in the point of the doctrine, the point of what Paul was giving to them was all about what they should be having for the Lord's sake. Not who they were, but what the Lord wanted Paul to do. And he is the apostle of the Gentiles. Now go back to Romans chapter three, uh, 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans 4. Verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, and he goes on about Abraham, using him as, as an example. Hmm. Was Paul the apostle of the Gentiles? Yes. Why did he say Abraham was their father? Look back in chapter 1. Uh, Romans chapter 1. And by the way, I want to point out something. This is of no real consequence to you, but I want, to, want you to notice that we're talking about what I'm talking about. <laughs> may not be clear yet what I'm talking about. What I'm talking to you about is the, the man who, whom the Lord sent to you, the Gentiles, and how he did his job is very important for you to understand. He had a reason to do this this way. But I want you to notice a, a real oddity. Not, not, it's not an oddity. Obviously, it's a necessity. But it's an interesting thing. You know, there's two things that, two, that, that people who learn how to write, you know, like write long things or write treatise or write a thesis or write uh, an essay or a novel or a history book, anything. People who learn to write, there's, there's two things that are very difficult for them. It is very difficult, very difficult to keep personal pronouns out of their writing. I, my, me, mine. Very hard to keep that out. Second thing that's hard is to 
put it back in. If you can say a thing without using a personal pronoun, and then it seems you need to use the personal pronoun, how do you do that? Well, I want you to watch this. In Romans chapter 1, he says, verse 1, he says, Paul, and he begins to describe the Lord's call upon his life and what he's called to do. Then you get th clear through verse 7 before he ever uses a personal pronoun. And from verse 8 down through verse 16, all about the presentation of the gospel that is the power of God into salvation. It's all about how in the world Paul is going to do that. Personal pronouns are used 19 times in those eight verses. But from verse 17 on, all the way over to chapter 3, uh, there is a use of a personal pronoun in verse 5, but it's in a parenthesis when he says, I speak as a man. Uh, but the next uh, uh, personal pronoun of consequence to what we're talking about is verse 26. It goes from chapter 1, verse 17, to chapter 3, verse 26, not mentioning himself at all. Not putting himself into the picture. But then when he gets there, he says a very interesting thing. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew, to everyone to believe it, to the Jew first and also the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Next use of personal pronoun, chapter 3, verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time, his, that's God's righteousness, that he, God, might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Two things. The writer has a hard time doing, keeping a personal pronoun out and then putting it back in when it's necessary. Both of things are very difficult in writing. And he just did it perfectly and in such a manner that it tells us what the Lord was doing, not what Paul was doing. Isn't that something? 19 times in eight verses and then not anymore for something like 60 something, 63 or something like that verses. I just want you to see that. Now, here in Romans chapter 4, he says Abraham is our father. Verse 1. Well, why? Well, because of what he's drawing on. Notice in chapter, uh, well, right there, chapter, we'll just use chapter 4. Verse 3. For what saith the scripture? In the book of Romans, in Romans, Paul uses, if, if I'm, you can count them up and see, 43 Old Testament verses. 43. Some people said 48. Maybe you're right. I don't know. It's a bunch of them. Why? Because of who he was telling about this to. To, for who, to whom, for whom he was telling it. Did the Jews get the gospel of Christ preached unto them first? Yes, they did. Were they there? Well, yes, they were. But notice chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, just like in 1 Corinthians 12, verse, Romans chapter 11, verse 13 says, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. How was he magnifying his office? He was using Old Testament scripture to prove to Jews who Jesus Christ was. Now, this comes to it. That's what we're talking about. Notice, if you will, um, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You know, there's five or six places my mind just went zipping past to, to say, start here, start here, start here, start here. But 1 Corinthians 9 came up twice. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says in verse 16, he says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, a woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, <clears throat> but if against my will, <clears throat> in the sense of I must, and if he says, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel 
is committed unto me. Committed? Dispensation of the gospel? Committed? Committed. Committed unto me. Committed. It's drawn to Paul for Paul to, to speak of. It's drawn to him. In other words, the Lord didn't give this to anybody else. He gave it to Paul. Remember the first Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12? Got it by revelation. Well, then, then what's he going to do? He's going to present it. They will, it's it's going to be difficult. Yeah, it is. Some Jews are going to love it. Some Jews are going to chase him out of town, throw rocks at him. He's going, he's going to go through this for 30 some odd years. And finally, the Romans are going to kill him. So here comes this dispensation of the gospel. Now, here's the deal. The gospel is this, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The gospel is according to scripture. Christ died for our sins according to scripture and buried and was raised again the third day according to scripture. It is exactly what Paul should preach to Jews. It is exactly what Jews should preach to Gentiles. And it's exactly what we should preach to anybody we can find. Does the gospel change between the time of Romans chapter 15? Uh, I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Romans chapter 3 and 4, uh, and, um, and the explanation of it that you have found in Galatians versus the gospel, the gospel of the uncircumcision versus the gospel of the circumcision. Is, is, is there any, has, has anything changed about it? No, that's because the dispensation of the gospel is going on right now. Paul, I'm going to say A.D. 34. You can correct me later. All the way over to here and on an ongoing basis, you. You got it. You got it. The power of God unto salvation where you stand is the same power of God unto salvation that Paul preached, a dispensation of the gospel. Now listen, folks. You can say there's a gospel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John if you want to, but you won't find that one that I've been repeating to you three or four times. You won't find that one back there. You can say that the dispensation of the gospel's always been there because there has always been a gospel, and you'd be right about that, but the dispensation of the gospel that's a pertinent uh, to you and me is the one given to the Apostle Paul because he is the apostle of the Gentiles. And that's who we are. Gentiles. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. Now some of you will not notice a difference in the, the passages, in the, in the intensity and purpose of these passages, and some of you will. But by the time we get done, I'm not trying to change the gospel for your sake, but I am trying to change the emphasis of the gospel from what Paul was doing to what you and I are told to do. Now, there's this, once again, there's so many things that I could do here. I've got four pages of notes I haven't even got off the first one yet. And I don't mean this like my notes are perfect. I just mean there's a lot to say about this subject. So here's the thing. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. He, God, hath chosen us, Paul and the Ephesians, in him, in, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Well, that's going to have to go a long ways back before there was a dispensation of the gospel. Way back over here. Way back over there. A dispensation of the gospel doesn't come about until the Lord gives it to the Apostle Paul. The reason I touched my ear there is because I was thinking about reminding myself to say, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, I know that, that uh, I have a great advantage here tonight. I don't know who any of you are who are listening. Hi, Dorothy. I do know that Dorothy's listening. Thank you for being here. She's on Zoom, and Dorothy is here uh, from some real southern 
town that I just hate to bring up. So no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, but my point is, she she knows this gospel, Dorothy does. And and my point about it is, I don't know whether you do or not. The rest of you, I don't know. If you have a testimony of salvation, knowing that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and was raised for your justification, and therefore you trusted him as your Savior. I don't know if you've ever written it down or not, but if you haven't, do it. I've gone to a lot of funerals, and the funerals that had the greatest message was when the deceased had written out their testimony, and I could read it to the crowd. Write your testimony. One page, two pages, one paragraph, I don't care. Write your testimony down, beloved. Write it to somebody. And you may go, you may be the first to go in your household, or you may be the last to go, but write it down. Somebody's going to be left after you, unless we all go in the rapture, of course. But somebody's going to be left after you. They need to know your testimony. Why? Because you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Doesn't it make sense that you tell people that? God Almighty chose you in his son before the world began. And you're going to slip off into eternity and nobody knows where you went? Tell them. Stand up and tell them out loud, but write it down. Write it down. Could I, could I beg you? Please do that. I have a file, of a bunch of them, which some of those people that I have that testimony, I've already read that at their funeral. And some of them were young people that, of course, are probably going to one day read mine. But my point about all that is this. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Do you not realize where you are? Now, I know that you are not as Paul in AD 34. You are not as the Galatians. You are not even as the Romans. You're not as the Corinthians. But you are as these Ephesians. Now, the dispensation of the gospel began somewhere about AD 34. And somewhere probably uh, 30 years later, there's another dispensation starts. And it starts because of, of, of a number of things. But I want you to notice in chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3. Paul writes in verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. A dispensation of the grace of God requires the gospel, or else the grace of God cannot show up. But the dispensation of the grace of God is to show a magnitude of the power involved in the gospel that the Jews didn't actually see, even the ones who believed Paul's gospel. They didn't actually see this. When he told them about it, they got angry. That it was about the Lord sending his gospel into this dispensation of the grace of God. The dispensation of the grace of God. And the dispensation of the grace of God has never yet come to an end. I don't know how long it's going to go on, but I do know what accompanies it. I know what's with it all the time. It's the gospel. The dispensation of the gospel is with the dispensation of the grace of God every day. Because the gospel is how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, live, believe on him, rely on what he did, trust in him, you're not lost. You're in the dispensation of the gospel, even though you were born in and came into understanding in the dispensation of the grace of God. People say, well, that's two dispensations. Well, sure it is. But then again, I didn't write this book. I just read it, and I believe it, and I hope you do too. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, go back there just a moment. 
there is a formula here <clears throat> that might this might be this formula that unfolds your salvation for you may be all in one evening. It may be over a period of days, maybe over a period of years. It may be 20, 30, 40 years long. As long as the end result is that you trust Christ as your Savior. Now, look at it. How much time do you think you have left, by the way? Uh, tonight? Maybe. Uh, notice, if you will, he says uh, in speaking about this dispensation, and, and there's a slightly different curve there we'll ignore for tonight, we'll get back to. Says in verse 12 that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. So here's Paul looking at these Ephesians saying, You also trusted in Christ. Then he says, Here's that, here's how that came about. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So how'd that work? You heard that Christ died for your sins. I heard that all my life. And I, my brother Jack and I went to the same church and Jack says he never heard that preached in a separate Baptist church, but I did. I heard my dad preach it. Besides, when my dad would sing, he wasn't going to cross Jordan alone. He also added that line, Jesus died all my sins to atone. I knew my only hope of salvation was in Jesus Christ when I got as lost as I could stand or couldn't stand. And I trusted Christ. I put my trust in him. I knew he was the only hope there was. There's no other savior. Jesus Christ is the savior. Well, that took several years in my case. I grew up with it. I sat, probably walked away from hearing the, all that preaching and sing, uh, lot, song singing and all that sort of thing when I was about 15. And then I didn't uh, pay any attention to it again until I got under the understanding that I was about the world's worst hypocrite when I was 22 years old. My point about that is, yeah, some people it takes years. Some it doesn't. I know people, and you do too, no doubt, that would give you a testimony of hearing all about this 9, 10, 12 years before they ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel, the power of God unto salvation is carried forth in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's waiting to seal you. Become your seal. When you trust Christ, got it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what Paul said. Now, here's the thing. In Ephesians 1, when this occurs, he explains to them what they have, and it is an enlightenment. Because these people probably didn't know, they didn't carry around Bibles, or didn't have any uh, uh, iPhones with Bibles on them or a computer in their uh, study at home. They didn't have any Bibles. They heard people speak the words coming from God's word. And when they heard it, they understood by reasoning how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for us, and on and on. Now, here's the thing. When Paul begins to tell, to, he, when he acknowledges that he knows these people have trusted Christ, in verse 12, 13, 14, then he begins to explain to them. He says verse in verse um, 17, he's praying for them along these lines. Now, I believe that you ought to pray for your brethren, especially those in your lifetime that you don't believe have ever trusted Christ or that they've ever seen the full grace, the, the, the picture of the grace of God in perfect uh, harmony. Uh, this is the kind of prayer you should pray about them. You say, well, they believe in Jesus. I don't know if they're saved. Believing in Jesus is a good start. They're not lost. They're a believer. Whether or not they get saved is whether or not they put their trust in Christ. But the lost don't believe in Jesus. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them, what? Them that are lost? No, them that believe. So you may have a lot of friends going to some denominational church somewhere, uh, uh, hyper to the world or dead in a doornail church, and they may believe, but they never understood the gospel of the grace of God. They never understood where they're living. Dispensation of the gospel. Dispensation of the grace of God. That's where we're living. Now notice in verse 17, 
The prayer says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now notice what this is going to show you. From here on, it's about what the Lord is going to show you from his word. And it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 an encapsulation of the word. Look at verse um, uh 18, now as you understand being enlightened, here it is, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You know, you can talk to people about Jesus. You can talk to him about on the Sea of Galilee, walking on the water, feeding the 5,000, hanging on the cross, mother weeping. But you talk about raised from the dead. You start talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you make a point of that our resurrection is based upon his resurrection. If he had not gotten out of the grave in three days and three nights, bless your soul, the scripture would have been false he would, have been, he would have been no good. He would have been of no, no value to the Father. And you and I would never have had a chance to be saved. And especially, we would not have a chance to have our sins left in hell when Christ died with all our sins on him. If Christ was not resurrected, there would not be a resurrection. But he was resurrected, and there is a resurrection, and it's yours and mine to share. So he says, the exceeding power of his greatness toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now watch what happens next. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church that Paul is writing this to, these people in Ephesus, and the ones he's been preaching to since he got that gospel, is the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 says, you're the body of Christ and members in particular. Romans chapter 15 says, one body in Christ. And here it is again. Same church, Ephesians, same church, same dispensation of the gospel but now we're in the dispensation of the grace of god keep reading verse um, uh, 23 uh, the, the church which is his body and then it says the fullness of him that filleth all in all the body is the fullness who's doing the filling christ what's he going to fill it up uh, what's he going to have to fill it up you, me, and whoever else we can get to see the gospel of Christ. Look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, it's a reference to the, the uh, grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, actually. And it's about, it's about understanding it this way. Verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, Jesus Christ left the earth, went up on high. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first unto the lower parts of the earth? He that descended up, I'm sorry, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Go back to chapter one again. And look at verse 23. His body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You are the body of Christ and you fill up something. Boy, this is fantastic. This doesn't sound like the Old Testament uh, uh, literature, does it? No, it doesn't. Mercy sakes, it doesn't sound like the Old Testament. It doesn't even sound like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, it doesn't. When you study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, you will have to be rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Well, then don't claim something is yours that's not yours. And don't say something ought to be yours if you do good and you're going to miss out on it if you don't do good. That's not the way it is. That's not what happens. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, you're made a member, a permanent member of his body. God put a seal upon you and you cannot throw that away. When you trusted Christ, did you trust him? Did, when you trusted Christ, nothing can take that away from you. Nothing will try. Even the devil knows that he can't do it. He believes the book. He don't believe the book for his own sake, but he believes it. He's going to lie and lie and lie until he finally gets just nearly everybody not to believe it. But he knows what he's doing. He's a, he's a liar and the father of it. And there's only one lie. It, the father of it. Now look, in, in Ephesians chapter, um, uh, let's see, where was I here? In Ephesians chapter uh, 2, there's an awful lot I'm leaving out of this, and I'm sure that most of you know I'm leaving a lot of this out because this isn't, this isn't about the detail of the doctrine. It's about who we are in Christ. And it's about the dispensation that we're living in. We're living in a dual dispensation. We have only the same gospel Paul did. And we're living in the dispensation of the grace of God. Here's the thing. Let me give you an idea of the dispensation of the grace of God. It is not up to you to talk anyone into this. It is not up to you to correct them when they're wrong. In fact, there is a book that transposes, so to speak, between these two dispensations. And it's the book of Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians, verse uh, chapter four through six in particular, but the whole book is a transitional book. And in chapter 12, he says that he, he is telling, he's going to say, um, I forgot the verse, uh, somewhere in, in the first 12 verses, he says he's going to say things later that he can't say right then. He knew them and couldn't say them. Why? Because he has to get into this dispensation of the grace of God and so he tells these people a very, very important thing. Right there in the middle of that, chapter 5, go back there. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hold on to Ephesians 2, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want you to notice something. We'll start reading in verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Now, the reason I'm reading this is, is not to try to add any confusion. I hope it doesn't. But I want you to see something about who you are. Who are you? Who do you belong to and why do you belong to him? And what's he want you to do? You're not anybody's cop or steward. You're not anyone, any, anybody's hierarchy. There is no hierarchy in the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We're the body. Period. And I say, well, one part's more uh, prominent. Yeah, sure is. And that's up to the head. Not up to the body members. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. That if one died for all, Christ died for all, then we're all dead. There's no death called. We're not called upon to go through death as it is described in the Bible. Verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live, that would be us. I mean, he died for us in AD 33. We weren't born until a little bit later than that. And so as a consequence of that, we're still alive even though, spiritually speaking, we died with Christ. He died for all. And there's no death left upon us. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, death is not left upon you. Say, so, what? Well, your body's going to die. Yes, it is. And you don't want to see it go, do you? No, I don't want to see mine go either. But I'll be glad to go once I go. That's, by the way, that's explainable by the Bible. Verse, verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, 
but unto him which died for them and rose again. So Christ died for us, was buried, was raised again. Therefore, since we were dead with him, and according to Romans chapter 6, we're also alive with him, so we should live for him. Verse 10, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. See what I mean about not being anybody's boss, guardian, telltale? No, 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 no. None of that goes on in the church, the body of Christ. Does it? Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, he was here, back here, there he was there, just before he was crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We do not know Christ as he lived in this life. We know Christ as he reigns in heaven. We know Christ sitting at the right hand of God the Father. We know Christ as our head. We are his body. Keep reading. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now this I know. Because I got saved when I was 22, I did not learn about how to study by rightly dividing the word of truth until I was 31. So I know that throwing away the old things that are passed away <laughs> is not exactly easy. And after I learned about rightly dividing, it took a full six months of Bible study before I left the denominational church. But I knew, <clears throat> I knew long before that it had to be done. But you see, there's, there's all these entanglements and you get, you get sort of wrapped up into some church system somewhere. You've got to be able to throw that all off, and you can't do that automatically, and I don't ever recommend anybody does that. Recommend. I've never told anybody to quit their church, not even if they ask me. It's not between me and them. It's between them and the Lord. And I appreciate Brother Moore and some other people that I met during that time. They never once told me to quit being a Baptist. They never told me to do that. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? Because they knew the answer was in the scripture, not in their opinion. Now, now notice this. Keep reading. Uh, he says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now watch verse 18. And all things are of God. Hmm. Sobering thought, isn't it? who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, here's the ministry of reconciliation in a nutshell. You're not driving. <laughs> you're riding, but you're not driving. No. Sorry about that. Crazy. Every time I look at this phone, it's, it's making a noise. I, it throws me into a dither. I don't know what to do about the noise. Anyway, see, you're not in charge. You're not the boss. And you're not driving anyone else. And no one is driving you. We are ministers of the reconciliation. Now, keep reading. Here it is. This is the explanation to it. Verse 19 says to it, which is here's the explanation. This is what we must say. Some people don't like this. They get mad because you say it. <laughs> Read the scripture. It says, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What can we then say to them in the word of reconciliation? We can say, Christ died for all your sins. If you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the work he's done for you, he'll save you and count you as a brother in Christ. Now, if you go back to it. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now watch. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though uh, God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. So the, what, are, what is our words? The words of reconciliation. God has reconciled the world unto himself. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that reconciles us to him. 
Simple as that. Straightforward as that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 17 through 21. Verse 21 says, For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you trust Christ as your Savior, the righteousness of God is upon you, even if you don't feel it. The righteousness of God is upon you because God Almighty saw to it that his son's heirs, joint heirs, are not less than he is. God did that. He sent his son to die for the sins of the world, and his son went, willing, gave up his own life. He died on purpose. And when he died, it took care of the sins. And when God raised him from the dead, three days and three nights later, it was proof positive that just as the prophecy said, so it came about. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised for our justification. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I thank you for being here tonight. We will do this next Wednesday night at six o'clock. Once again, so thanks for being here. We'll talk to you again soon. Good night, everybody.